I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. Mike Ballard, the CEO of Camino Verde Group, and his wife and son, who shall remain nameless. <laughs> if you want to introduce yourself, you're more than welcome. Um, Mike was born in Nellis Air Force Base and raised in Las Vegas. He moved 10 times by the time he graduated from high school. While his parents treated him and his sister well, they had challenges and issues. His father was an alcoholic who sobered up when Mike was 12 and died when Mike was 19. His mother was a compulsive gambler until the day she died. So because of this, at a young age, Mike decided he would neither try alcohol nor gambling. In his senior year of high school, he became a committed member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and then served a mission in Milan, Italy. Mike graduated from BYU, and after working for some large companies, started his first business, Ballard Communications. The firm became the largest PR firm in Nevada and one of the largest in the country. Mike founded the Vegas Valley Angels, a Shark Tank-like shark tank investment group, which invested more than $16 million into 24 companies throughout the Western United States, primarily Las Vegas. He's also helped secure more than $50 million in equity financing from more than 30 companies. In 2014, he founded Ascent Multifamily Accounting, a specialized accounting firm serving the apartment industry, which was recognized as number 374 on the annual Inc. 500 slash 5000 list, which is a prestigious ranking of the nation's fastest growing private companies. In 2019, Mike partnered with Kevin Romney to start Camino Verde Group, a real estate development and asset management company with properties in Nevada, California, Utah, Texas, Iowa, Kentucky, and South Carolina. The total development costs of all their projects is more than $550 million. Ephraim Crossing, a 140-acre development in South Ephraim, is one of those projects. And by raise of hand, have any of you heard of Ephraim Crossing? Yeah, a couple hands, all right. Most of them don't know about it, Mike, so you can tell them, yeah. Um, Mike is deeply committed to charitable and community service. In July, he concluded his term as president of the Las Vegas Rotary Club. He served as a board member of BYU's business school, the Marriott School of Management. Uh, the UNLV Lead Institute for Real Estate Studies. UNLV Technology Advisory Board, and the Editorial Advisory Board for the Las Vegas Review-Journal, Nevada's largest daily paper. Mike's been married and has four adult children living in Utah. He was a former Little, Little League baseball coach, soccer coach, served as his son's troop scoutmaster. He won't ask you to do the scout, oh, but you can if you want. And was a seminary teacher for four years, so please welcome Mike Bell. Okay, now, yeah, now, I'll try. now let's try to present. I think that's this. One, two, three, abracadabra. There we go. There we go. Isn't that a cool cartoon? <laughs> you know, one of the things I hope to take away from this is that you don't have to be perfect. You can have plenty of defects, however you want to define those, and still be successful and happy. Um, oftentimes, it's what makes us weird is what makes us wonderful. What makes us weak makes us strong. Um, uh, there's a scripture some of you may have heard of that, you know, where God says he gives us weaknesses that we can be humble. And if we're humble and we work at our weakness, we can be better. You know, I know this through sports. You know, my kids were good at part of what they were trying to do. They played football, lacrosse, baseball, soccer. Um, and if they'd work on the thing that was their weakness, over time they could make it their strengths. Um, this quote may seem a little weird, but anything outside the norm is deviant, right? Is a deviance. And so deviance will always generate external pressures to conform. If you perform beyond the norms, the systems will adjust and try to make you normal. Um, I'm telling you, think differently. In my career, my wife jokes sometimes, I just can't keep a job, you know? Uh, I started at 14 as a paper boy. I'd get up at five in the morning, deliver papers in my neighborhood when there used to be newspapers to be delivered, 
And uh, I did that for a couple of years, and then I worked at Circus Circus Casino in the Dime Toss in the arcade where kids would go. Um, it's a dive hotel today. I wouldn't advise you going there anymore. You know, but I've, I've had lots of different jobs. And so I'm going to share some stories from these different experiences. Um, the ones that are in bold are the ones where basically I was uh, self-employed. Um, the income was kind of, I wasn't getting a W-2 salary. Uh, I think everything we've learned about a lot of our weaknesses is wrong. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. In a... Excellence is a form of deviance. Uh, the way to achieve and maintain excellence is to deviate from the norm. Do things that other people aren't doing. Um, work a little harder. Do a little more. Do the one thing. Um, that maybe somebody else doesn't want to do. Be willing to go a little farther, right? As kids, I remember when I grew up, I grew up in the day where they used to swatch you. And uh, in the sixth grade, I had a, a teacher, not a professor, you know, a sixth grade teacher, Mr. Booth. And uh, Mr. Booth, uh, you know, I. I've never been diagnosed this, but I think most people that know me know that I have ADD or ADHD or whatever you want to call it. I have trouble. I like to do a lot of things. I like to keep busy. And that was not a good thing in school. Mr. Booth swatted me. Um, he had a bed crib about that thick around, you know, two and a half feet, 62 times that year in front of the class. Then my little table, and uh, you know, after the first three or four, it got harder and harder. <laughs> I was one of those that, you know, they, they pushed to conform a little bit. Um, but remember, what makes us weird makes us wonderful. How many of you heard of uh, Tim Lincecum? Pitcher, who's with the Giants for a lot of years. Do you remember what he's known for? His hair is kind of funky, um, like, throwing motion. Exactly, his funky throwing motion. His, him and his dad worked at it. He's a hundred and, I want to say he was a 170 pound pro athlete. And when he was going to college, all these coaches, he, he was an amazing player in high school, but he had this funky pitch. And he would only pick a college that would allow him to keep throwing the way that he threw. And all these coaches basically ignored him, wasn't really drafted. Um, or he, he ended up being drafted, but he, he had to do it his way because that's the only way a kid with his frame could do it. He wasn't built like many of the other all-star pitchers there were. So oftentimes, those of you that can be successful have the tools of greatness or the people that are in the dean's line <laughs> waiting to talk to somebody because you've had issues. Um, the challenge is many brilliant, talented, creative people don't think they are brilliant, talented, and creative. They don't think, you know, they, they, they may have some issues. And sometimes their greatness was stigma, stigmatized. Um, so one of the first things I want you to think about is your weaknesses are clues to your superpowers. Your weaknesses are your clues to your superpowers. Um, this one author wrote, we are led to the truth by our weaknesses as well as our strengths. How many of you have been fired? It's okay. I've been fired a few times. It's okay. Um, I, um, I remember as a teenager I was fired because I cared about sports more than I cared about keeping a job at a local restaurant called Chicken Out that was a fast food chicken place. And he wanted me to work on a day that I had a tournament game. And I said, I'm not coming to work that day. And he said, you know what, Mike, you're fired. <laughs> and that was the first of me being fired a few times and having some disagreements with some people. But that's okay. Um, 
Accept that our weaknesses are our strengths in disguise. Right? Being easygoing sometimes is being irresponsible. Being adventurous is sometimes being dangerous. Being spontaneous is sometimes being impulsive. Being structured is being inflexible. You know, you can, we can go on and on, all these lists. But our weaknesses can be clues to our greatness. Your strengths are weakness. And sometimes if you fix your weakness, you're ruining your strength. Uh, David Nealman, anybody ever heard of that name? Other than the professor here? He started a couple of airlines. Does that give you a hint? Um, most recently, he just started Breeze Airways. He owns an airline called Azul. He started also JetBlue, and uh, he built an airline, Morris Air, that sold to Southwest. He said he had ADHD, and, uh, and he said, and he was asked in an interview, how much, you know, when did you start taking medication? He said, I never did. That would kind of suppress my superpower, <laughs> right? So think about that. Um, strong people always have strong weaknesses too. You know, we need to have a certain amount of discipline to succeed in life. You need to know better, related to your family, re related to certain things, you need that. Um, but sometimes uh, you gotta accept the valleys when you have peaks, right? Walmart, does anybody know how Walmart started? So Walmart was just a five and dime store back in the day when it first started. Most of you have no idea it's only been this huge conglomerate. But there was Sears and Roebuck, there was uh, Kmart, there were all these other big retailers. And Walmart, when it first started, um, Sam Walton only started in small towns. He said, I can't compete with the big boys in the big cities. And he just spent targeted towns with less than 100,000 people. And that was his, his shtick. And he basically built and built and built until pretty soon he had an empire that he could start attacking the big boys on their own turf, right? So that was the key. And he was always pushing to drive costs down. They were the first retailer to automate. And then Kmart, which was one of these big kind of uh, all you can be type stores, they went into bankruptcy um, multiple times. They've been bought by private equity firm after private equity firm. And, and they're barely succeeding where Walmart became the biggest company in the world for a while. And now it's still one of the top 10 biggest companies in the world. So sometimes striving for excellence, striving to be the top at what you do, um, if you try to be a jack of all trades, you'll be a master of none. Sometimes being focused in one or two areas is what can keep you from being me uh, mediocre. So appreciate that we succeed because of our weaknesses oftentimes, not in spite of them. Every limit is a beginning as well as an ending. You know, the times, you know, I've had, um, I've had the misfortune and the fortune of being fired as well as being able to, you know, having the responsibility to let people go and to fire them. Uh, oftentimes, it, it, I've seen several people that we've let them go for one reason or another and they thrive in a different environment. They weren't meant for the environment of the organization that I was in at the time. And sometimes when you get fired, you get at your lowest, or when you get cut, or you know, um, everybody, probably everybody doesn't know, but remember the story of Michael Jackson, or Michael Jordan being cut from his high school basketball team, right? That turned out to be a turning point in his life. So sometimes when you hit a wall and you have to retreat, that is okay. Um, so uh, sometimes many people have issues with learning. And that's okay. 
the founder of Ikea, who we're all, we're all familiar with Ikea, I'm sure, especially as college students, a lot of great furniture for us, right? The founder there had trouble making it through school. He had dyslexia. And uh, Richard Branson, the famous entrepreneur, hotels, you know, airplanes, spaceships, all kinds of things, he basically also has dyslexia. He had major issues in school. And he said, but it taught me a different way to learn. And strangely, he was quoted, he's been quoted many times, I think my dyslexia helped me become the success that I am. Your challenges can sometimes push you in a direction that is better for you. Um, what makes us weak makes us strong. So think differently and act differently. Exaggerate, amplify sometimes your weaknesses rather than eliminating them. I remember after I first got in, uh, uh, was kind of a new member of the, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I went to something called Education Week. It was being held in Vegas. And this guy spoke. And uh, he was just made a general authority. And his name was, uh, I think his name was Ruland Craven. I think his daughter-in-law is now some sort of general authority in the church. But I mean, he gave this talk, and as he talked, I'm like, this guy sounds like the country bumpkin. And... Um, the job that he had before becoming a general authority was he was the secretary to the church. And, and I would see him right on the board. He wrote probably three or four things. This was way before they had projectors like this and that type of thing. He would write two sentences and there would be words misspelled in each one of them. And he said, I learned to focus on my, his speech was all about Focusing on your strengths, not on your weakness. He said, I've never been able to spell. I don't know why. I can't do math very well. But I figured out what I can do. I pay great attention to detail. And I get things done. And I just ended up in one position after another in the church, uh, working for the church. And, and he ended up being uh, secretary to the prophet. And then he became a general authority himself. So think about how you can amplify your weaknesses. There's a guy who went to Clark High School in Las Vegas that I think you all know, who became quite famous. But, uh, oh, and I can't remember his teacher's name, but he was a little younger than me, and he was always getting into trouble. And I think his teacher was Mr. White. And Mr. White basically kept throwing him out of class. And one day he threw him out and he said, I don't think you're going to amount to much. And so, basically, Jimmy Kimmel, who went to Vegas, went to Clark High School in Vegas, went to UNLV for a little while, just did comedy. Because that's what he was good at. He was a smart aleck in class. You know? And then, uh, several years ago, at the White House Correspondence Dinner, he was asked to MC that. He, uh, said, hey, and I have it quoted here. In his speech, as he was talking about, as he was emceeing this dinner with the president there, the White House Correspondence Dinner, um, he said, I also want to thank Mr. Mills, that's his name, my 10th grade high school history teacher, who said I'd never amount to anything if I kept screwing around in class. Mr. Mills, I'm about to high five the president of the United States. Eat it, Mills. <laughs> right? Just know that if you don't succeed in certain areas, so what? Focus on what you can succeed at. And you may starve for months or years or weeks or whatever till you figure it out. Many of those music sensations that we know basically struggled for years and before they became an overnight sensation. So how can we amplify our weaknesses? So I was working um, right out of college, 
I went to work for Xerox Corporation, which was one of the biggest companies in America at the time. It'd be the equivalent of uh, Microsoft. And you know them as the copier maker, but they made laser printers, they made computers, all that type of thing. And um, I just, Vegas was a stepchild city for Xerox. They didn't, it was just frustrating. I wasn't making the money I expected. So I ended up working for two different accounting firms. And uh, I learned, I was a, I was a nerd. Oh, you bet. Um, I was really good with numbers, and I really stumped with words. On my ACT, you guys know the ACT is college, right? I didn't miss a question in math. But I got a 36. And the average for everything, I think, was 18. But in the writing stuff, I got, I can't remember what they called it, it verbal or social or whatever. I got a 14. And uh, I stunk, but I was good with numbers. So I ended up, I like doing sales and talking to people. And uh, that's what I did at Xerox. And one accounting firm hired me because I knew technology and I could sell and I could talk numbers. So I ended up going to work for this national accounting firm in their Vegas office, selling computer system software, accounting software for hotels, for contractors, and for real estate property managers. And I did that, and then I went, uh, that firm had some issues nationally, and then I went to RSM McGladbury and Pullen, which was another national firm, did the same thing. They appreciated me more. Getting laid off, because Raventhal and Horath closed their eighth office, it was an amazing blessing to me. I went from, and again, these numbers are distorted, I went from making a base salary of 30,000, got fired, you know, plus I got commissioned, so I was making about 50 or 60,000 a year. I got fired, ended up interviewing with three other accounting firms to do the same job. They saw what I had been doing for the three years before. The new company gave me 48,000, a better commission schedule, and a bigger expense account. Um, but then I started making more money than one of the partners at the firm because I became, real, I kind of figured out how to sell accounting services. And that was a problem, so they wanted to change it. And over a period of five or six months, they kept working with me on, would you accept if we changed it this way or that way? And after about three months, I realized this is not gonna work, they're gonna cut my compensation down. And uh, as they kept working at it, I quit. And I said, I've got a proposition for you. I'm quitting, but I'd like to maintain a good relationship and I'd like to be my first client. I said, I'm starting a consulting firm, a marketing firm, and would you be interested in being my first client? Here's how much I want you to pay me, but I'll only work you know, 15 hours a week for you, and then I'm gonna work for other clients. And they said, sure. And in that three months that I knew I was leaving, I lined up uh, a law firm to work with, to do work with, and some others. And that's how I started my first business. But um, being fired at the first accounting firm gave me so much more compensation, so much more confidence in myself for the second one. Uh, how much time do we got? About 15 minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these fast. So don't try to fit in, try to fit right. How many of you know who Michael Phelps is? Right? I think he's won more Olympic gold medals than anybody in the history of the world. Why is it? He trains like an animal. We all heard about how much he eats as well. But he was built for that. Um, the funny thing that a lot of people don't realize, he has this amazing torso. We do realize that. What we don't realize is the bottom half of his body, he's kind of a freak in that way. He, well, I think he's 6'4", he has the inseam of a jockey that's 5'6". Right? He has super short legs, which helps in his business. He found his fit. Right? He, and he found it early. Not all of us have that privilege. Um, how do we find the right fit? Right? You know, 
differentiation often re requires us to not be well-rounded, but to focus, right? Being truly different requires us to be lopsided. There's this young gentleman, Matthias Sch Schlittel. Um, he was born with a rare genetic disorder. Doubt any of you have ever heard of him. I hadn't until I heard uh, the author who wrote a book talk about him. But basically, he had one bone, or his arm bones on one side of his body had, were 50% bigger than the density of the bone on the other side of his body. If you can see it in that picture, one looks thin, one looks massive. And so, what could someone like that do, right? He could pout, he could complain, he could have surgeries, or he could become the most successful arm wrestler <laughs> there ever was. <laughs> you know, he's won multiple national championships, right? Excellent, excellence requires us underperforming, not, you know, sometimes you think, how does that person do it? They, you know, how many hours a day do they do it? Not all of us can work to be fantastic in all these areas. There's only 24 hours in a day. But oftentimes, excellent requires us doing less in certain areas so we can do more. So we need to think about this. This is a hotel company I thought was pretty interesting. They had these hotels that really had no amenities. They had lots of issues. So they advertised, we don't have a mini bar, we have a hip lounge. Right? They had super small rooms. We don't have a concierge. We have a cool app that will do all the stuff that the concierge does. Right? We don't have a pool. We have a pool table. You know, that type of thing. Focus on what you have and forget about it. Just go forth confidently. Be who you are. Decide what trade-offs you'll make. And then just do the best you can. Um, sometimes you need to decide, I'm not going to do well in this area because I need to focus on that. Right? It's about prioritization, deciding what you want in your life. Um, partner with people that, uh, that are strong where you're weak. Right? Peter Drucker, who's considered the best management consultant and thinker there ever was, he talked about organizations exist to make strengths, people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. Right? The best coaches, you know, a lot of great football coaches, look at their players and they say, what, who am I, you know, who, where can I build uh, our plays around to have the most success? Right? So who is strong where you are? Does anybody know what this building is? I would tell you, basically every year, millions of people come to see this building. But they don't really come to see it. They come to see its neighbor, right? Um, it's the building next to the Lean Tower of Pisa. That's how we know it, <laughs> right? Mussolini, the dictator, when Hitler was going across, he was embarrassed by the Lean Tower of Pisa, and he wanted to fix it. And the people in the area stalled, kept stalling him. And they tried to fix it a little bit, but it never did. And the Lean Tower of Pisa, this, uh, this, these buildings are famous. That building is famous because of its lean, right? It has a defect, that building does. You have a defect. I have a defect. I have plenty of them. My wife will tell you, right? We, get, we have lots of issues, all of us, right? It doesn't matter. You can be world famous and get the appropriate amount of attention because of its tilt. The, basically, the tourism board, another, basically, you know, about 40 years ago, they thought about trying to make it straight again. And the tourism authority board basically was quoted saying it's important to keep the current tilt due to the vital role that this element played in promoting tourism in Pisa. Okay? So now I'm going to jump back to a couple more things and what led me to do what I'm doing now. And uh, this is a building in Minot, North Dakota. And this helped change my life in a great way. I, as you had heard, I was involved with the Angel Investment Company. And we had funded a company that ended up doing extremely well. And I served as advisor to the company and knew the founder well. 
and I upgraded him a lot of money. And so he, after he had a lot of money, he bought this building that used to be the YMCA of Minot. Built, I think, in 1950. And he was gonna, and we converted it uh, to an office building and apartments. He bought this building from the YMCA for $750,000. And then he got the local bank to guarantee a loan for him to do improvements so that he can move the company that we funded on the bottom floor there, Sure ID. It was called EID at the time. And so they basically, he, he had a signed lease. He could lease the first building. Uh, he got the improvements, uh, the money to make the improvements. They moved in. And now that they were paying rent and he had cash flow, he went back to the bank and said, now I'd like you to fund us doing improvements on the next floor. And then we did that again and refinanced it again the third time and we were able to do apartments on the top floor and do some condominiums on the other side where the racquetball courts were. And ultimately, this building was appraised for five and a half million. The gentleman put $750,000 into it as cash and had $2 million in debt on it. So by putting $750,000 in cash, he, he made $2.75 million. And I was like, that's amazing. So then one thing to, led to another. I met uh, with some guys that I had worked with before at one of the accounting firms. And we started, uh, I started doing work with them. I talked them into creating this accounting firm as I was doing consulting for them. We did, created this accounting firm called Ascent Multifamily. And we grew to be one of the fastest companies in America and were profiled in Inc. Magazine. Okay. Uh, and it looks like I accidentally duplicated. Uh, from there, so actually, let me go back to this. As eight years ago, in 2014, he started this company. And I was one of the partners. And we started picking up these clients that we do back office accounting for apartment owners all over the country. And uh, I would take them to dinner when I'd go to conferences that were in their cities we meet with the different clients around the country, and they would, over dinner, they would tell me more of their story on how they got so successful. And after hearing that for about four years, I made a business plan. I want to start finding a way to buy and own real estate, like the tech company did, and how we made money there, and how a bunch of other people that I knew were making money. And so uh, Kevin Romney and I started a set, uh, started Camino Verde Group, and shortly after that, while I was still being a consultant, um, I was asked to do a tax credit job from a guy in Ephraim, Utah. And I'd been through Ephraim once to go see the Manti pageant. That was my only experience. I had no memories of Ephraim. But I come here and I start working with Colby's Kettle Corn. Anybody ever hear of Colby's Kettle Corn? Well, he, he makes popcorn and snacks and sells them all over the country to restaurants and that type of thing. And we helped him get some uh, capital through tax credits to grow his business. And while I kept coming here, every, uh, every month, basically, everybody kept saying, there's no housing here. There's no housing. We need housing. Um, and so I said, well, I know a little bit about housing. So I called up a local realtor that I had met, and we bought our first couple pieces of land. And um, we, uh, we call it E from Crossing. And our branding is this. High tech, it's a real makeover in central Utah. Utah is becoming well known for its tech community. Utah County is getting a lot of complaints about the growth, the rising cost of housing, the, the traffic, the congestion, the overcrowding of schools. I thought, you can be anywhere. Why not be an E from? So we started a marketing plan to start marketing to Utah County tech companies. And uh, we've, we've got one or two that have signed. Um, can't announce them yet. Uh, one, other big company is coming. But, so we've been marketing this town and we started building homes. We started buying one piece of property after another. We call it Ephraim Crossing. And we had to tell people where Ephraim was. 
some, there's a lot of people that come here for tech jobs that have no idea where it is. So we talked to them about putting an office in Ephraim and see how that might affect your workforce because you can buy a house for half or maybe a little more than half of what you can buy one in Utah County. So we've been buying acres and acres and acres here in Ephraim. We own 140. We have another 105 under contract. And uh, our goal is to create a walkable community. And we're creating this area called Village Walk Lane. It'll have restaurants, you know, with lights above. We'll close the restaurant off, that type of thing. We've master planned it um, to have 700 different types of households. Apartments, homes, uh, homes for rent, townhomes for sale, townhomes for rent, a senior community, a senior rental housing community, one story. Um, so we've got, we've got plans for a grocery store right there um, and warehouses on the far side over there. So uh, the central core is where we have planned this village walk where we'll close off the street, have probably six restaurants, office buildings right around there. Um, and uh, here's part of our first phase. We've, we've got people who've moved into homes. Uh, even one or two professors have. People that are working at the city as the city's growing town homes, that type of thing. So we've got a tech office building planned. All the stuff you'll see in the next three years. Um, phase two is across the street. We've got a, you need hotels. I tried to get a hotel yesterday in Ephraim. I couldn't. And then I called Manhattan in Mount Pleasant. We couldn't get anybody to answer the phones. And we've rented, there was a time when, another time when one of my associates came to Ephraim because of our project. Willow Creek was booked. So we booked online another motel in Manti. And then he gets there at 11 o'clock at night and nobody answers the door. He had to go down to Salina or Richfield to stay because if you book online after 10 o'clock, they don't give you the key. <laughs> so you, have to be, you had to pick it up beforehand and he didn't read that in the fine print. So we do have one tech company. We, we do have one Salt Lake company that is buying a big chunk of land. Uh, they're planning on bringing 300 employees here high paying jobs um, and uh, I know they're working on a partnership with the school. So we created this vision and you know we, we master planned it, we spent some money, we had to put some of our money and time at risk, uh, but it appears to be working out. And so if you know people that want to own one of the restaurants or you know, be in one of the buildings there, we're willing to joint venture to help, you know, we want to have part of it on, let me go back up. On this area here, where the big parking lot is, we can close the parking lot and basically before a football game, have rallies, you know, and just have people come there. We can have after game events, that type of thing. Uh, so we've got lots of opportunity. Uh, Sorry, what's the timeline on this? Did you say three years? So we started building homes. We started now doing the infrastructure for the townhomes. You should see the townhomes start up in the next two months, uh, if not the next three weeks. But we're still having yet one issue with some permits on, on the townhomes. So it's probably two months. But basically, we talked to fast food restaurants that say as soon as the big company announces, I'm taking this little lot across the street. I'm doing this. So we've got about six or eight companies that are dominoes waiting to fall, and we can't announce them. They have to announce what they're going to do. But we have a lot of. Um, have you considered turning yards into certified wildlife habitats um, to counter the ecological destruction and also they give you um, tax benefits? So. Uh, Ephraim is an opportunity zone. Ephraim also is a new market tax credit zone. 
there's lots of benefits. We're trying to do, we've got a couple, uh, we've got a couple parcels that we want to do something creative. You know, we're trying to keep a lot of the old stuff and bring it in as part of markers in the community. We're trying to create extra white sidewalks in certain areas, that type of thing. But we are trying to do a couple things like that. Um, part of it is just timing and funding and that type of thing. So, uh, I want to, sometimes we don't believe in ourselves until someone reveals that deep inside us something is valuable. Worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred of our touch. I can promise you that every one of you has something special. You all have some sort of superpower that maybe other people consider a big weakness. I'm telling you, it may take you five or 10 years. You know, I, I have jumped from place to place, sometimes to the frustration of my wife and kids, uh, that we found something that's really made a difference in our lives and in the lives of others. We're doing some stuff in Vegas related to homelessness um, that nobody's been willing to do. We're trying to work on some special projects where we can make a big difference. I wanted to leave you with some books that I believe you ought to look, people your age ought to read. Um, here's five. Think and Grow Rich was one of the very first ones. You can listen to almost, you can listen to all these online. Um, Good to Great Atomic Habits, The Freak Factor, which is where I took a lot of the ideas of today's discussion and the magic of thinking big. I can tell you, if I leave you with one thought, when I first started Eat From Crossing three years ago, I had no idea it would turn into what it has. But once I started the process, something a little more became believable. And as we moved down the line, something a little more became more believable. I think the same is true for your success. Start down a path of hard work, committing to do something more, something different, that type of thing. And, and your future, a bigger, better future becomes more and more believable for you. I know, I know there's something uh, within each of you. And don't beat yourselves up. Help use that to help you find your superpower. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.